You're listening ad-free on Amazon Music. One night in October of 2001, a young woman named Amy and her friend whose name was Eric were at a dance club in Portland, Maine. Amy was having a blast, but Eric wasn't. He seemed bored and maybe a bit annoyed. Amy tried to convince him to come out on the dance floor and dance with her and have some fun and lighten up. But Eric said he wasn't interested. So Amy, determined not to let this ruin her night, she wandered over to the dance floor by herself. And Eric would watch her for a few minutes from a distance, and then he would leave to go use the bathroom. However, when he came back, Amy was gone. And 72 hours later, just about everyone in the state of Maine was asking the same question. Where did Amy go? But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right podcast because that's all we do and we upload twice a week, once on Monday and once on Thursday. So if that's of interest to you, please sneak in to the Amazon Music Follow Button's home and swap out their Samsung The Wall IAB Series 146-inch Class 4K UHD HDR commercial monitor for a 13-inch black and white TV from 1995. Okay, let's get into today's story. On Thursday, October 18th, 2001, Amy St. Laurent stood in front of her clothes closet in the small main town of South Berwick. She had a big meeting coming up the next week at work, and she wanted to pick out just the right outfit. Amy was an attractive 25-year-old woman with strawberry blonde hair and blue eyes who wanted to become a model. She'd even gotten some professional photos done. But when it came to her job at Pratt & Whitney which was an aircraft engine assembly plant, she wanted to be taken seriously. And that meant dressing professionally so that people didn't get the wrong idea from her looks and youth. But as Amy tried and rejected one outfit after another, she knew that the real reason she was making such a big deal out of this was to distract herself. She was trying to avoid thinking about the man who was coming to visit her that night from Florida. Amy had recently broken up with her boyfriend after living together on and off for five years, She wanted to get married and have kids, but she realized that her ex, Richard Sparrow, was just not the one. She liked to travel and go to museums, and the longer she'd been with Richard, the more she realized he was just a homebody who didn't care much about any of those things. She felt like breaking up with him was the right decision, but it was still hard. But now that she had broken up with him, she was able to rediscover the joy of being single. And a few weeks ago, she'd taken a trip to Florida, and she had met a handsome 27-year-old man named Eric Rubright, who had taken her out on his motorcycle. He'd even tried to kiss her, although Amy had politely declined. Ultimately, Amy had a lot of fun with Eric, and so when Eric asked if it was possible for him to travel to Maine to visit her, she said yes. But Amy was not interested in a romantic relationship again, and she didn't want to lead Eric on. So she made it absolutely clear to him that when he visited in Maine, nothing romantic could happen between them, and he would have to sleep in the spare room. Eric said he was totally fine with that, but just in case, Amy had another safeguard planned for this visit that she didn't mention to Eric. Her ex-boyfriend, Richard, had offered to come over and hang out with them as a buffer, like a third wheel. And now, standing in her bedroom, thinking about how potentially awkward this three-way dynamic was going to be, Amy hoped she did not make a mistake in either inviting Eric or inviting Richard. That evening, Eric arrived at Amy's apartment, and right away, things got off to a bumpy start. Despite what he said, Eric did not seem thrilled about sleeping in the spare bedroom. And he was clearly annoyed that Amy's ex-boyfriend, Richard, was just at the house with them. And then on Friday, which was the second day of Eric's visit, Amy and Eric got into a little fight. By Saturday, October 20th, so the third day of Eric's visit, Amy was just tired of Eric's constant grumpiness and disappointment. She'd been very clear with him that she did not want a romance, so Amy decided that for the rest of the time Eric was visiting, she would just go out and do the things that she thought they both would enjoy, and you know what, if Eric didn't like it, then so be it. So Amy took Eric to Boston to go to the Museum of Fine Arts, which was one of Amy's favorite places, and then afterwards, they went out for a nice dinner and Amy noticed Eric seemed to be having a much better time now. So, as they were driving back towards Maine, Amy asked Eric if he was up for stopping in downtown Portland, which is a city in Maine. But as soon as Eric said yes, Amy immediately began worrying that she was underdressed for a big night out on the town. She was wearing jeans, sneakers, and a sweatshirt with her company's logo on it. She considered going home to change first, but at the same time, she didn't want to dress too provocatively and give Eric the wrong message, so she decided she would just go as is. 
Downtown Portland is a really popular spot, especially at night. And so when Eric and Amy got there, all the restaurants and bars that lined the cobblestone streets were packed, and mostly with young people. Amy suggested they stop at a sports bar, and Eric seemed interested. But as soon as they went inside, Eric began acting all disappointed again. Amy wanted to play a game of pool, like billiards, but Eric didn't. So Amy, determined not to have a terrible night, just went and found a couple of 20-something-year-old men named Russ and Cush who she could play with. And then the three of them would play and they would talk and laugh, while Eric just kind of awkwardly stood by, drinking a beer and looking bored. After a while, though, Amy started worrying that she was being rude to Eric. So she took him to get some pizza and even paid for his slices herself. Then she asked if he wanted to go to a cool club called the Pavilion that was partly inside an old bank vault. Amy hoped that the pavilion would impress Eric, but as soon as they walked in, he got that annoying, bored look on his face again, and he immediately said he didn't want to dance. And at this point, Amy was just kind of over Eric, and so she left Eric standing in line for drinks while she headed for the dance floor all on her own. On Sunday afternoon, so the following day, Amy's mother, Diane Jenkins, drummed her fingers on her laptop inside of her South Portland home, trying to burn off some nervous energy. She was getting concerned about her daughter. Amy had called her mother around 10 p.m. the night before, and Diane could tell from the sound of Amy's voice that she was in good spirits. Amy had said that she and her friend Eric were driving downtown, and so she asked her mom if she wanted to join them for a drink, since she lived pretty close. But Diane was already in her pajamas, so she said no. But after that, Amy had not called again, which was odd because the mother and daughter talked every day. Diane picked up the phone again and called her daughter's cell phone, but it went to voicemail for the fourth straight time. Diane wanted to think that Amy was just busy with her weekend guest, Eric, but it had been hours and hours, and Amy never ignored her calls for this long. So Diane picked up her phone again, but this time she called her ex-husband, who was Amy's father. He lived close to Amy and took care of her cat whenever Amy was away for more than a few hours. But when Amy's dad picked up, he told Diane that he hadn't heard from their daughter either. And so Diane really started to worry that something could be wrong. The next morning, when still Amy had not called her mom, Diane called Amy's work. But the person who answered the phone call said Amy hadn't shown up. And she hadn't called ahead or emailed ahead to tell anyone why she was not coming into work. At this point, Diane felt a full-blown panic attack coming on as it dawned on her that her daughter truly had disappeared. And so Diane hung up on that call and then immediately called the police to report her daughter missing. That evening, which was October 22, 2001, Detective Danny Young flopped onto the sofa and flipped on Monday Night Football. It was the veteran detective's first night off since the 9-11 terror attacks on the World Trade Center in New York. For the past six weeks, Young had been investigating crimes by day for the Portland Police Department, and then by night, he and his bomb-detecting dog had been doing extra patrols, checking out the Portland Ferry for explosives, or checking out suspicious packages. And so at this moment, the detective's living room couch never felt so good. So when his phone rang a few minutes later, Detective Young wasn't sure if he even wanted to answer it. But he slowly did get off the couch and he picked up, and on the other line was a deputy sheriff from the county who said he needed Detective Young's help. He told Detective Young that the daughter of one of his friends was missing after she had spent the evening with a guy from out of town. The sheriff told Young that the woman's name was Amy St. Laurent, and her mother had already filed a missing person report in Portland, and her family had already gone out and begun putting up missing person posters all over the place. But police had not launched a full-scale investigation yet because Amy was an adult and she had not been gone for very long. But this deputy was wondering if maybe Detective Young could help off the books. Detective Young wanted to say no because he was exhausted, but Amy's disappearance felt oddly personal to him. He had a daughter who was not only Amy's age, but shared the same name. And like Amy St. Laurent, Young's daughter also loved going to the Pavilion nightclub. As the deputy sheriff told Young more about Amy and why her family was so worried, Young's gut told him something was wrong here. So he told the deputy he would look into this. After the call with the deputy sheriff ended, Detective Young called a supervisor to tell him he was going to investigate this Amy St. Laurent case. But the supervisor thought this was a bad idea, that it was a waste of time. A 25-year-old woman disappearing after a night of partying was not exactly big news. Maybe she had a hangover, or maybe she met up with a guy and didn't want to come home quite yet. 
Ultimately, the supervisor felt like the chances that something bad had happened to Amy were pretty slim. Also, the supervisor pointed out that this was Detective Young's first night off in a really long time, and he needed to take a break. But Young was adamant that he wanted to do this, and so after some convincing, his supervisor let him launch his own unofficial investigation. Before Detective Young left his house, he called a sergeant at the police station. Since Amy's friend, who she was with the night she disappeared, Eric Rubright, was from out of town, there was a good chance he had rented a car. So Detective Young wanted the sergeant to call the local rental agencies and see if any of them had a record of Eric renting a vehicle from them. And sure enough, the sergeant quickly called Young back. Not only did the sergeant know that Eric rented a maroon GMC Envoy, but she also had another important piece of information. The car Eric rented was equipped with a GPS tracker, which meant the rental company knew the vehicle's exact location in downtown Portland. Detective Young immediately sent some officers to stake out the rental car. And within an hour, Eric showed up right around 10.30 p.m. And strangely, he wasn't surprised to see the police officers at all. He told them he'd already seen the missing person posters that Amy's family were putting up all over Portland. And he said he was concerned about Amy, too. And so the officers would take Eric back to the police station to ask him some questions. By the time Detective Young got to the interrogation room late that night, his fatigue from six straight weeks of work had disappeared. For the detective, it was like flipping a switch. The second he launched an investigation, it was the only thing he cared about, and he could focus like a laser beam no matter how tired he was. Eric was already sitting in the interrogation room, and the detective quickly sized him up. The first thing he noticed was how big Eric was. Eric had played semi-professional rugby, and Young thought how easy it would be for him to overpower someone Amy's size. But the second thing Young noticed was that Eric seemed agitated, like someone who was afraid he was in trouble. And as Detective Young peppered Eric with questions, Eric's story began to sound pretty odd. He claimed that on the night Amy was missing, they were at the Pavilion Club, and then after the last call, which was sometime between 12.45 and 1 a.m., Eric went to the bathroom. But he got stuck in a long line. And then by the time he got out of the bathroom, Amy had taken off, leaving him alone. So he got in his car and he circled the block once to see if he could find her. But when Amy didn't turn up, he decided that she would just have to find her own way home and he left. But what made this story so hard to believe was that according to Eric, Amy had left her wallet, cell phone, purse, and car keys in his car. Detective Young was about to ask Eric to explain this when someone knocked on the door. Young frowned, but he knew nobody would interrupt unless it was really important. So he excused himself and stepped out of the room. And once he had, an officer handed him a phone. And when Young put it to his ear, he heard his sergeant's voice. The sergeant said he was with three young men who had flagged down his patrol car to tell him they were with Amy the night she disappeared and they needed to talk to police right now. Detective Young told the sergeant to bring them in right away. But Detective Young had to get back to his interview with Eric so he assigned other detectives to talk to the three young men and just report back to him. The three young men eventually arrived at the police station, and they introduced themselves to the detectives. They were Russ Gorman, Kush Sharma, and their other roommate. And obviously Russ and Kush were the two young men that Amy had played pool with on the night she went missing and they would tell the detectives that recently a bartender had showed them the missing person poster of Amy, and they instantly recognized her as the woman they had played pool with, and so as soon as they saw it, they left the bar and flagged down the first patrol car they saw. Russ was a charming guy who had very stylized hair. He had frosted tips, which meant the ends of his hair, kind of all throughout his hair, were bleached blonde, and he gelled his hair up. And although he'd only been in Portland for 18 months, he was already a regular in the bar scene there. And he would tell the detective that he and his buddy Kush had been playing pool when Amy had come over and asked to join their game. And Russ would say that actually he and Amy hit it off right away, and he actually asked for her phone number. But Russ made it clear he did not expect this to go anywhere, because he watched as Amy literally went back to her date, and so Russ and Kush just left and went to another bar. But then the two men went to the Pavilion nightclub, where sure enough, they ran into Amy again. This was around the time that Amy had gone to the dance floor on her own. She saw Russ and Kush, and the three of them basically started dancing together. 
And so Russ would tell the detectives that the three of them just danced all night. And then after last call, Russ said he wanted to keep partying, so he invited Amy to come back to their apartment. He told her they were going to have an after-hours birthday party for their third roommate, and he wanted Amy to join them. And so she agreed, and they all got to the apartment at around 1.15 a.m. But the birthday party never really materialized, and Russ could tell Amy was really bored. And so eventually, he just asked Amy if she wanted a ride back home. And Amy actually said that she wanted a ride back to the pavilion because then she could go find her date, Eric, and he could give her a ride home. And if for some reason she couldn't find him, her mom's house was right nearby and she could just walk there. So at about 2 a.m., Russ dropped off Amy right outside the pavilion on the curb. And then after watching her head towards the pavilion, Russ just drove home and stayed there for the rest of the night. And when detectives spoke to the other two roommates, they would tell basically the exact same version of the story. The detectives were excited. It sounded like Russ may have been the last person to see Amy alive, and so they rushed to tell Detective Young what they had learned. Detective Young was still talking to Eric when the detectives knocked again on their door. And when Young stepped out and they told him what Russ and the roommate said, a new theory popped up in Detective Young's head. He wondered if maybe Eric saw Amy get dropped off by some other guy, and maybe that sent him into a jealous rage. But when Detective Young walked back into the interview room and sat down, he said nothing to Eric about what he had just learned. Instead, he asked Eric to go over all of his actions after Amy had left the club without him. Young wanted to see if he could maybe catch Eric in a lie. Eric claimed that after he realized Amy was gone, he just drove himself back to Amy's house and then let himself inside using Amy's key. But when he didn't find Amy inside, he said he felt weird about staying in her house all alone, so he slept outside in his car. The next morning, Eric said he left his car and went back inside of Amy's house to use her shower and also to drop off all her belongings she had left in his car. And then afterwards, he said he did leave an angry note pinned to her apartment door. And then he left her coat outside right on the hood of her car and he dropped her keys onto one of her tires. And that was the end of his weekend. When Eric stopped talking, Detective Young couldn't help but feel like this guy's story just seemed totally off. And soon, he would have yet another interruption that would confirm his suspicion. Suddenly, another detective called Young out of the interview room to tell him that Amy's neighbor had called her local police department on Sunday with her own concerns about Amy's safety. She'd seen Amy's expensive coat on the ground beside her car on Sunday morning, so she had knocked on Amy's door to see if she was okay. But it wasn't just the coat that made the neighbors nervous. On Friday night, the neighbor had seen Eric angrily peeling out of Amy's driveway, and when the neighbor actually asked Amy what was going on, Amy said Eric was furious with her because Amy didn't want to have sex with him. So when this neighbor saw the coat on Sunday morning, and then she knocked on Amy's door and Amy didn't answer, this neighbor went and got Amy's keys from the landlord, and when she went inside and realized it was empty, she called the police. Detective Young had never in his life had so many witnesses volunteer to help out on a case, and every single witness story really seemed to point the finger at Eric. And it was easy to imagine Eric being mad after driving all the way to Maine from Florida, only to be rejected. And the neighbor's story was especially damning for Eric, because it meant that Eric was already enraged that Amy wouldn't sleep with him the day before Amy had left him for two other guys at the pavilion. And Detective Young thought Eric's story about driving to Amy's house and sleeping in his car on a night when the weather was in the low 40s, so nearly freezing outside, was nonsense. But when Young went back in to question Eric about all of this, Eric did something very unexpected. He said he had proof that he drove to Amy's apartment late on the night she disappeared. Then he pulled out a receipt from a gas station, which was located on the way to Amy's apartment. And Eric told Detective Young that if this receipt wasn't enough, he also had a witness. On his drive to Amy's, he had to pass through a toll, but he didn't have any money. And the toll taker had basically taken pity on him and let him through anyway. And so as a result of that, Eric was confident she would remember him. By now, Detective Young's head was spinning. This was the most chaotic interview he had ever conducted. Usually, investigators had to hunt for tips. But tonight, they were pouring in too fast for him to even keep up with. The detective felt like Eric really was his best suspect, but Russ had been the last person to see Amy alive, so he couldn't be ruled out yet. But this actually wasn't even the biggest question that Detective Young faced, because Amy's disappearance actually wasn't officially a criminal case at all. Amy was an adult, and she'd only been gone for two days. 
Her friends and family were obviously worried, but as of now, there was no evidence that any crime had even been committed. Amy might actually be just fine. Some of the other detectives thought Detective Young was kind of overreacting. They thought Amy was going to waltz in any minute, wondering what all the fuss was about. The next morning, so three days after Amy disappeared, police went to her apartment to go look around. They found the key to her apartment sitting on the tire of her car, exactly the way Eric had described. But when they found Eric's angry note he had left inside, they discovered that it was much nastier than Eric had said it was. In the letter, Eric asked Amy very angrily where she'd gone, with a choice curse word thrown in. It was very clear Eric must have left feeling very mad, chucking Amy's coat as he left. When they searched Amy's apartment, the police took her computer, her mail, her answering machine, and even her diary. And as they flipped through the pages of her diary, they found pages of Amy's deepest thoughts, her struggles, her fears, and her hopes. But there was one name that kept coming up over and over again in this diary. It was Amy's ex, Richard Sparrow. In fact, she'd started this diary the day after she had broken up with him. So that day, the police picked Richard up at his house, they drove him to the station, and they put him in the same interrogation room where Detective Young had just questioned Eric the night before. And when Richard told the detective that he had slept over at Amy's place on the first night that Eric was visiting, Young felt his heart start to race. It was hard to imagine a more awkward or potentially explosive arrangement than having an ex-boyfriend sleeping on the couch while Amy's new man slept in the guest room. It was the type of situation where you could understand one or both of these men getting really mad. But Richard would tell Detective Young that truly he was on friendly terms with Amy and that he had only stayed in her apartment on Friday as a favor to her after she begged him to. And also, on the night that Amy disappeared, Richard said he went out in South Berwick with friends and then went home, an account that Richard's roommates all confirmed, which meant he was very likely many miles away from Portland when Amy went missing. So this interview with Richard really had Detective Young turn his sights back towards Eric and Russ, the two men who were chasing Amy on the night she vanished. As the days went by with no word on the whereabouts of their daughter, Amy's parents became increasingly desperate. On Thursday, October 25th, almost a week after Amy disappeared, her mother Diane went to the media and offered a $35,000 reward for information that would lead to Amy's safe return. And by now, Amy's case was no longer an off-the-books investigation by Detective Young. This was now a full-scale police operation. As a reminder to himself of just what was at stake, Detective Young put a photo of Amy on his desk. By now, Detective Young was pretty sure he knew which one was responsible for Amy's disappearance, but he couldn't prove it. So for now, he was just going to treat Eric and Russ like equal suspects. When Young had checked both men's backgrounds, he'd found they both had criminal records. Russ was on probation for theft, and the night he gave Amy a ride, he was driving with a suspended license and facing the prospect of having his license revoked entirely. Eric had some minor drug offenses on his record, but more alarming was his ex-girlfriend in Florida had a restraining order against him. Weirdly, her name was also Amy, and she even kind of looked like Amy St. Laurent. Police had begun a much more aggressive search for Amy. Sheriff's deputies retraced Eric's route from the nightclub back to Amy's apartment, checking anywhere that somebody might be able to hide a body, but they found nothing. Police in surrounding communities looked through abandoned buildings, and they searched the train tracks and highways and the edges of the harbor. National Guard helicopters searched from above, and detectives even spent their own time looking for Amy on weekends. But no one could find any trace of Amy. Meanwhile, both primary suspects left town. Eric went back to Florida, where he lived and worked, while Russ went to Alabama, since he had family there. Usually, Detective Young would want to keep his suspects close, but in this case, he was actually happy that both men had left. He figured the killer might relax once he was away from Portland, and maybe he might confess something to somebody close to him. Five weeks later, there was still no sign of Amy, and everyone at this point feared she was dead. Officers who had initially been skeptical that Amy was even in trouble were now drawn into the case out of real concern for the young woman, 
they'd learned so much about Amy during the investigation, not just the details of the last few days before she vanished, but the details of her life, how kind she was and how spontaneously generous. One couple told police that Amy gave them money out of her savings one Christmas when they didn't have money to buy presents for their kid. Another friend told police that Amy one time had paid for a plane ticket so the friend could fly home to celebrate her parents' 50th wedding anniversary. Amy even took a leave of absence from work to stay at a friend's bedside when they were in a coma in the hospital. Some of the officers began referring to Amy as, quote, our Amy, almost like they were her father. Detective Young found himself constantly looking at that photo of Amy he kept on his desk, and whenever he looked at her, he felt like she was looking back at him, pleading with him to help her. And as time dragged on without any breakthrough, people in Portland began getting scared that a killer was literally on the loose among them. And you gotta remember that this was around the time right after 9-11, so Americans at this time were very much on edge. And now Amy's disappearance had only made the paranoia much worse for people in Portland. As the lead detective in the hunt for Amy, Detective Young felt like so far he was letting the public down, especially her family. But he didn't really know what else to do. Without a body, he had no crime scene and no evidence. And so he was totally stalled. And that's when Detective Young got an unusual offer. A lieutenant from the Maine Warden Service named Pat Dorian thought he might be able to help find Amy. Every year, Dorian and his team found over 300 lost hikers, mostly people who got turned around inside of Maine's vast forests. Even though they'd never looked for a dead body before, the lieutenant thought the wardens might be able to apply their expertise to this case. Detective Young wasn't sure that a bunch of game wardens could help, but winter was coming, and once there was snow on the ground, finding a body would be much more difficult, if not impossible. So Detective Young told the lieutenant that yes, he would like his help. So on Monday, December 3rd, which was six weeks after Amy had vanished, Detective Young squeezed into a crowded conference room at the police station and took a seat at the conference table. Detective Young's team sat on one side and Lieutenant Dorian's on the other, all of them looking over a table full of equipment, computers, and mapping programs. Detective Young began by showing the wardens all the places the police had already searched. But Dorian really wanted to know more about the suspects, so his team could get a better sense of where either man might go to dispose of a body. So Dorian asked questions like, how familiar were they with the woods and the outdoors? And were they the kind of people who would feel comfortable hiking into an unfamiliar area? Detective Young decided he would just focus on the one suspect he was pretty sure was responsible for Amy's disappearance, which by this point he fully expected was a murder. It was a gamble what he was doing, but in his experience, Young had seen that the more focused a search is, the better the results. So for hours, the people at this table, Dorian, Young, their teams, discussed every detail of the case, and about the one suspect that he was focusing on. But a question from the wardens caught the detectives by surprise. Did their suspect have access to a shovel? And surprisingly, despite all their interviews and questions, none of the detectives had any idea. So immediately after the meeting, Detective Young asked other investigators to find out whether the suspect had a shovel. And right away, word came back that the suspect did have a shovel, and in fact, he had borrowed the shovel recently. Five days later, at 6.30 a.m. on December 8, 2001, a new, massive search for Amy began. 100 officers and 45 Maine search and rescue volunteers fanned out across southern Maine, along with cadaver dogs that are trained to smell dead bodies. But after hours of searching, the team found nothing. The cadaver dogs indicated that they smelled something a few times, but it turned out to just be nothing but dead animals. Then, around 1 p.m., searchers turned down a side road off the highway that had been used to haul gravel to expand the road. At the end were trails that led off into the brush and some debris from the construction. With snow closing in, the searchers spread out in a line shoulder to shoulder and marched into the woods just as they had at other potential burial spots. And after about 30 minutes of this, one of the searchers ducked under a branch and they came upon a spot where the earth seemed to have been pressed down and kind of smoothed over. So the searchers brought over the dogs and right away the dogs were barking and pointing at that spot on the ground. Searchers immediately yelled out for Detective Young to come over, and when he did come over and he looked down at the spot, he could see there were some pine needles that had been thrown over this area, almost like to disguise it, and so it seemed very likely this was a burial spot. 
And sure enough, when searchers got their shovels and began digging in that spot, they would uncover Amy's badly decomposed body. The next day, Sunday, December 9th, the medical examiner conducted Amy's autopsy. And from this autopsy, it was clear that Amy had been beaten and shot. But there wasn't much other physical evidence to go on. There were no fingerprints or DNA from the killer on the body. In fact, her body was so decomposed that the medical examiner needed Amy's dental records just to confirm it was really her. Five days later, on Friday, December 14th, Amy's family held a memorial for her at a funeral home in South Portland. 25 white candles surrounded a photo of Amy, one for every year of her life. Beside the memorial sat a bouquet of pink roses, just like the flowers that her father would give her every year for her birthday. Detective Young would have loved to be at Amy's service, but he couldn't go because at that very moment, he was in his car driving south on his way to pick up the killer. Even though the killer had left the state, detectives had kept a close eye on him. And when Amy's body was found, they finally got their break because the killer had believed police would never find the body. And so when they did, the killer panicked. He called someone and he confessed to the crime. Finally, all the pieces fell together, and for the first time, Detective Young knew what really happened to Amy. In the early morning hours of Sunday, October 21st, the killer asked Amy if she wanted a ride home. At least that's what he told her he was going to do, because in reality, the killer had other plans in mind. When Amy got in the car, the killer kept staring at her. He thought she was absolutely stunning, and he was sure that if he could just make the right move, something might happen romantically between them. So he turned on the radio, found a good song, and began to drive. Eventually, the killer got onto the highway, at which point Amy told him he was going the wrong way. The killer told her that he was just going to take her for a moonlit walk. It was going to be great. But Amy said she had no interest in that and just wanted to be taken home. But the killer wasn't prepared to do that. So he pulled off the highway to a secluded spot and he turned to Amy and said, please just give me a chance. Then he told her how pretty she was and how attracted he was to her, hoping this might make her want to stay out longer with him. But it only made her more agitated and she eventually demanded to be taken home right now. And at first, the killer did begin driving back on the highway as if he was going to take her home, but then he turned down a side road, at which point Amy began screaming at him to turn around and bring me home right now. The killer could feel anger boiling up inside of him to the point where he just couldn't control it anymore. So he pulled the car over on the side of the road, he put it in park, and then he turned and just wound up and punched Amy. Stunned, Amy leapt out of the car and just began running. But the killer had more than just fists to hurt Amy with. He grabbed a gun from under the seat and then ran out after her. And when he caught up to her, he couldn't contain his anger. He hit her again across the face with the gun, splitting her lip and chipping her tooth. Then he hit her for a third time, this time hard enough to break a bone in her face. Amy tried to fight back, but her killer was much stronger and he knocked her to the ground and pinned her down. They struggled for a while, and at some point, the killer tore at Amy's clothes and sexually assaulted her. And then when he was done, he grabbed his gun again. He knew if he were to let Amy go, he'd get in big trouble. So instead, he put that gun to the right side of Amy's head and he pulled the trigger. The killer knew he needed to hide the body now, but he knew he couldn't do much in the dark. So he dragged her body into the nearby forest where she was out of sight, and then he left her for the night. And then the next day, he returned with a shovel and he buried her. Even before Amy's body was found, Detective Young had already begun to suspect one person much more than anybody else. Detectives actually managed to find surveillance video of Eric at a gas station alone at 1.36 a.m. on the night Amy went missing, just as Eric had claimed. They also found the turnpike toll taker who remembered taking pity on Eric when he couldn't pay the toll. And so with all that corroboration, police didn't think it was possible for Eric to have returned to Portland to pick up Amy by 2 a.m., the time Russ said he had dropped her off. But police had a harder time verifying Russ's claim that he had driven Amy from his apartment to the Portland nightclub and then returned home in just 25 minutes. Russ's roommates had vouched for him, but their stories didn't hold up. 
His roommate claimed he knew Russ came in around 2.25 a.m. because he was in the middle of writing an email to his aunt when Russ walked in. But when police looked through his emails, there was no record that he actually sent any email to his aunt. And police could not find a single person who actually saw Russ drop off Amy at the pavilion. Instead, police found evidence that Russ was lying. He got pulled over by police on the night that Amy went missing at around 3.14 a.m. for not dimming his high beam lights. So clearly, he hadn't come home quickly and then stayed home like he had claimed, because here he was, out and about at 3.14. Then, after Amy disappeared, police found that Russ had borrowed a shovel from his mom's boyfriend and the location of her body where she was buried. It was found less than four-tenths of a mile from Russ's mother's house. And in addition to all that evidence, Russ actually just confessed the entire crime to his mother after news broke that Amy's body had been found. On Monday, June 30th, 2003, Russ Gorman was convicted of killing Amy and sentenced to 60 years in prison. Amy's mother would go on to found the Amy St. Laurent Foundation, which was set up to help educate women and children of all ages in awareness, prevention, and techniques to protect themselves in dangerous or life-threatening situations. The organization is still active today. By the summer of 2007, Chris had been working as a park ranger in southeastern Pennsylvania for a number of years, and by and large, he enjoyed his occupation. Some of the time, he got to do what he loved, which was hiking in the forest. And some of the time, it required doing something he hated, which was office work that usually required staying late at night. On one of those late nights in August of 2007, Chris's boss, Mike, said that he needed to leave the office and go down the access road to this tool shed they had. He needed to get some equipment and bring it back up to the office for some reason, and he said he'd be back in about 15 minutes. As soon as Mike left, Chris decided, you know what, I'm gonna take a break from my work and I'm gonna step outside for a minute. Right in front of the office building was a little staff parking lot, and then about 50 meters beyond that was the edge of this really dense forest where the access road that Mike had just gone down to get to the tool shed basically split right through the middle and went straight out past the office. When Chris stepped outside to take his break, he sat down on the front steps that overlooked that parking lot and the access road, and he was just kind of looking out towards the forest, not thinking about what he was looking at, just kind of mindlessly sitting there, when all of a sudden he just started to feel like someone's watching me. And instinctively, he turned around to look back into the office as if maybe someone was behind him, but he remembered that he and Mike were the only ones there that night, so no one's gonna be behind him. And so he turned back around and he looked out at the parking lot and he didn't see any movement. And he looked down to the edge of the forest, which he could see because the moon was fairly bright that night. So the illumination was pretty good. And there was no movement against the tree line. There was no animals, there was no people. And Mike had not come back yet. So there's nothing going on in front of him. There's nothing going on behind him, but he just could not shake this feeling that someone was watching him. And so Chris, you know, he's not easily spooked. He's used to being out in the forest in the daytime and at night. He's used to being at this office. A lot of times he worked at the office on his own at night. So he's used to this environment. And so he thought, you know what, I'm going to go look around. And so he walks down the steps and he walks into the parking lot and he begins looking behind some of the cars. There's only a handful in the lot. There's nothing in the lot. And he keeps walking till he's about 10 meters away from the edge of the forest. And he looks into the forest and it's too dark to see anything. And there's nothing out here. There's no movement. There's no animals. Mike is still not back yet. And so even though he could not shake this sense that someone is watching him, he felt like, you know what? I did my diligence and there's no one out here. So it's just going to be in my head. And so he decides he's going to go back inside. And so he turns around and he starts walking back up towards the office when all of a sudden he hears this whooshing sound come past his head. And he didn't know what it was, but it sounded like someone took a stick and threw it overhand. So it's spinning like a tomahawk as it passed by its head. And because the sound was so loud and he was already on edge about someone potentially watching him, that he actually dove as soon as he heard it and fell to the ground and scrambled around and looked at the tree line from where this thing came from, but there's no one there. And he scrambles to his feet and he's still looking around and he starts backpedaling towards the office with his eyes still on the forest. And his attention kind of shifts from the forest to what was just thrown at me. 
and he turns around and starts walking around looking for something on the ground, like a stick, to see if something really was thrown at him, but he can't find anything. He didn't do an exhaustive search, he didn't look under every single car, but an initial scan turned up nothing. And then he turns back to the forest and he doesn't see anything out there. And even though, again, he feels totally stressed out, like something's out here and I can't see it, he's like, Am I going crazy? Did that really happen? Because I can't find this big stick that apparently flew past my head. So is this all happening in my head? But regardless, he's totally freaked out and he sprints back inside the office and locks every door. 20 minutes later, Mike comes blazing up the access road and stops in front of the office and runs up the stairs. Chris goes over, unlocks the door, and he lets him in. And Chris is about to tell him about this crazy stick-throwing incident, but he can tell Mike is really upset about something. Probably more upset about whatever happened to him than Chris is about the stick-throwing thing. And so Chris tables his story, he locks the doors behind Mike, and he turns to him and he says, What's going on? What's wrong with you? At first, Mike doesn't say anything. He just paces back and forth inside the office. And then finally, Chris calms him down and he gets him to explain what happened. Mike tells him that he was down at the tool shed, which is about a half mile down the access road and about 20 meters off the road into the forest. And he's at the shed, it's open, and he's pulling out the different pieces of equipment he's going to bring back to the office. And he says, all of a sudden, all the hairs on his body stand up. He's got goosebumps. And immediately he thinks, someone's watching me. And he turns around and there's no one there. He looks to his right and his left. He kind of pokes his head in the shed, like is someone hiding in the shed? There's no one in there. He walks to the back of the shed. There's no one behind the shed. And he's just totally stumped why he's feeling this way. He goes back to the front of the shed and he's going over in his mind what made him feel this way. And he can't put his finger on it, but he cannot shake this feeling of someone watching him. And it's making him totally anxious. So he gets all the things he needs from the shed as quick as he can. He locks it up, he turns, and he starts speed walking back out to his truck. When he gets about five meters away, he hears footsteps running right to left behind him back where the shed is. And because he was already completely on edge about someone watching him in the woods somewhere, he doesn't even turn around to see what that is. He knows he needs to run to his car and get inside and put steel between him and whatever is out there. Once he's inside, he locks the door, he turns on the ignition and looks one last time in the direction of where he came from. And to his horror, there is a man walking into the woods right next to the shed, turning the corner behind and disappearing into the woods. His instincts were spot on. He was being watched. And that's when Mike hit the gas and sped back to the office. Chris then tells Mike about his stick throwing incident because all of a sudden that seems a whole lot more real and they both agree that whoever threw something at Chris is probably the same guy who was hiding near the shed with Mike. Concerned this guy might come back and break into the office, they stay the night there and they watch the whole time, they don't see him again, and the next morning they file a report and they tell the incoming park rangers what happened, but after this there were no more reports of this strange hooded figure roaming around the forest, and to this day Chris and Mike have no idea who he is or what he wanted, but they can both agree, whoever he was, he was bad news. Our next story is called Stalker. In June of 2011, law student Lauren Giddings was only one test away from completing her dream and becoming a public defender. Even though she had a ton of studying still to do, she had taken off the first week in June to go to her sister's wedding where she was the maid of honor. Right before she left the wedding to go back to school, she joked with her family that she was going to be locking herself in the library and just studying 24-7 and that nobody should get in touch with her. But when she got back to campus, none of her classmates that she studied with saw her at the library. And in fact, when they didn't see her for a couple of days, they started reaching out to her and texting her and calling her to see if she was okay. But she never picked up, she never wrote back, and so no one knew what was going on with her. One of Lauren's classmates would reach out to Lauren's sister and would ask her, hey, have you talked to your sister at all because we haven't seen her? And Lauren's sister would write back and say, oh no, everything is just fine. Lauren told us before she left the wedding that she was going to be locking herself away and just studying 24-7, so I'm sure everything is just fine. But this classmate wasn't convinced because this felt very uncharacteristic of Lauren to not study at the library and then not to pick up any phone calls or text messages. So she would call the police and say, hey, can you please go check on Lauren's apartment because I think something's wrong. 
So a police officer goes over to Lauren's apartment and knocks on the door. Lauren doesn't answer. They try the door, it's locked. The officer goes outside and looks around the outside of her apartment. There's no broken windows. There's no obvious signs of a break-in. And so the officer leaves and says, I can't do anything else unless you guys file a missing person report. So a couple of days go by and there's still no word from Lauren. And at this point, Lauren's family is now concerned and they do file a missing persons report. So the police go back to Lauren's apartment. They try knocking. She doesn't come to the door. The door is still locked. So they get the owner of the apartment building to open up her door. And when they go inside, Lauren's not in there. And at first, it doesn't seem like anything is wrong until they notice her cell phone, her keys, her purse, and her laptop are all still in there. This made the police think there could be something sinister happening here. And so they went to Lauren's friends and family and they asked, does she have any enemies? Does she have any reason to be fearful for her life? Initially, they said, no, no one would want to harm Lauren. Everybody loves Lauren. But Lauren's sister would say to the police that there was actually one comment Lauren made a year ago that now seemed a little bit more relevant. Lauren had just got back from a vacation and she noticed there were things in her apartment that seemed like they had been moved, like someone else had been here, but no one was supposed to be in her apartment. And so she told her sister and the two of them talked about it a little bit, but it was quickly forgotten about because there wasn't a reasonable explanation and Lauren was so busy with school, she didn't pursue it. After police have done a thorough investigation of the inside of Lauren's apartment, they move outside of her apartment and begin scanning the exterior of the building and they make a huge discovery. An officer who was looking in the dumpster noticed this big black trash bag that looked out of place. And when he tried to move it, it was very heavy. And when they opened it, they found a human torso and it was Lauren's. Right before this discovery was made, a news crew had shown up outside the apartment building and was trying to interview people that lived in the apartment complex because they had been tipped off that somebody who was living here had been missing for over a week and now police were getting involved. They saw what looked like a resident of the building looking visibly shaken up, watching the police doing their investigation, and they went over to interview him. It would turn out his name was Stephen McDaniel and he was Lauren's neighbor and he was a classmate of hers in law school. The interviewer asked Stephen, what was your last interaction with Lauren? And Stephen became really focused on how he had not seen her in the last week. And in fact, speaking on behalf of my other classmates, no one's seen her. She must have just vanished. As they're doing this interview, right on the other side of a bush, this police officer discovers Lauren's torso and the news kind of gets out to the interviewer they've found a body. And the interviewer says out loud to Stephen, it looks like they found a body. And Stephen just completely changes and he goes, a body? And then he goes completely silent to the point where the interviewer says, are you okay? And he just stands there looking completely distant before walking away from the interviewer, sitting down with his back turned and hyperventilates before the interview ends. Once this case went from missing person to homicide, the police started searching all the rooms on Lauren's floor. And Stephen's room is right next to Lauren's, so he was the first room they searched. Apparently, as they began searching his room, he was standing just outside the door and sweating profusely and drank over 10 bottles of water. In his apartment, they found a key to Lauren's apartment. And what he would do is whenever she was gone, he would sneak into her room and download her hard drive, as well as steal little souvenirs like small articles of clothing and other things that he would hoard in his apartment. When they went on Steven's computer and checked his browser history, basically the only things he did on the internet were look at Lauren's Facebook and LinkedIn profiles. But the creepiest thing they found was this camera that was literally duct taped to this long pole. And on the camera were all these surveillance videos of Lauren because what he would do is he would go outside and he would hoist up this camera and he would film her through her windows in the middle of the night. Stephen was quickly charged with Lauren's murder, to which he pled guilty, and he would openly confess to the details of how she died in court. Most times, he used this surveillance footage to confirm she was not in her apartment so he could sneak in and steal from her. But on the day she was murdered, he would use that camera technique to confirm she was home. And shortly after confirming she was in fact home and asleep, he put on a mask and used his key to get into her apartment and walked right into her room, which woke her up. According to Stephen, she apparently sat up and said, you need to leave. At this point, he jumps on the bed and in their struggle, his mask would come off and Lauren would recognize it's clearly Stephen and she would plead with him by name to stop. But he didn't stop and he would strangle her to death. 
Afterwards, he dragged her into the bathroom and began cutting her up into fairly small pieces. Some of those pieces got flushed down the toilet. The others were put in bags, and only one of those bags was ever discovered, and that was the one of her torso. Stephen was ultimately given a life sentence. The next and final story of today's episode is called He Had Plans for Her. In 2014, a young woman named Jen was sitting in her sister's living room, looking out their back window where her son and her two nephews were playing. And as she's watching them, one of her nephews named Harrison walked over to this tree and began peeling the bark off of the tree. And for Jen, this brought back a very strange childhood memory that she hadn't thought about in decades. And without meaning to actually say the words out loud, Jen kind of blurted out what was going through her head, which was so weird. And her mother, who was in the other room, heard her say that and she yells into the room, hey Jen, is everything okay? What's so weird? And Jen, feeling a little bit embarrassed that she just said that out loud and that her mom heard her, is quick to try to dismiss it by saying, oh no, sorry, it's nothing, I didn't mean to say that. But as she's trying to dismiss it, her mom had walked into the living room where Jen was and saw Jen was looking out the back window towards the boys. And so her mom walked right up next to Jen and goes, what are the boys doing out there that's so weird? Are they doing something they shouldn't be doing? And Jen's like, no, no, it it has nothing to do with the kids. I I just saw Harrison who was doing something that reminded me of some weird thing that happened to me and I blurted out my reaction to it, that's all. And Jen's mom looks at her and says, well, now you gotta tell me the memory because I'm totally intrigued. Jen says, okay, mom, I'll tell you the story. I don't know if Frankie's mom ever told you this or not, but when I was eight years old, I spoke to Frankie and he was doing some homework and he told me to come meet him outside of his house and that when he was done, we could meet up and go play together. And so I walked over to his house and I was standing across the street in front of that small group of trees that we called the pine cone forest, even though it was just a handful of trees, but we all called it that. Anyways, I was standing over there and I was just kind of mindlessly peeling the bark off of the tree. I don't even remember consciously deciding to do it. And so as I'm peeling the bark off the tree, watching Frankie's house, waiting for him to come outside, I notice to my right, there's this guy walking through the forest towards me. And I look at him and I've never seen him before. And before he got even within 10 feet of me, I could smell cigarettes. He reeked of cigarettes. Then his teeth were very yellow. He's missing a number of teeth. And I noticed right away when I looked at his hands, I don't know why I was looking at his hands, but I looked at his hands and he had these pointy yellow fingernails that almost looked like he was intentionally growing them out to be long and jagged. And he comes walking up to me and stops completely in my personal space. And instead of looking at me, he looks at the spot on the tree where I had been peeling the bark off. And he's literally like one foot away from me, so close that I had to lean back because I didn't want to be rude and run away. So I'm leaning back to avoid being right next to this guy. And all I can smell is cigarette smoke. And he turns from the tree to me and he goes, what do you think you're doing? And I'm like this and I'm like, "Uh, I'm waiting for my friend. And he says, no, what are you doing to the tree? And I remember looking at him and then the tree and saying, peeling the bark off? And that's when he raised his hand up and pinched my arm with his nails, not with the pads of his fingers, but he was using his nails and he's pinching down on my skin and through gritted teeth, he says, how would you like it if someone peeled your skin off? I remember as he's pinching me, I was so terrified that I didn't do anything. I was like in a trance and just stood there looking at him, wondering what's about to happen. And then as luck would have it, Frankie's mom just happened to come outside and yelled, hey, come on inside, Frankie's done with his homework. And so that kind of broke me out of my trance. I pulled my arm away and I began running away from him across the street towards Frankie's house. And I turned around once, kind of expecting him to be chasing me, but he wasn't. He was still standing next to the tree that I had pulled the bark off of, except now he was watching me. And I ran up onto the porch and ran inside. And that was that. I remember wanting to tell you about it when I got home, but for some reason I didn't. And then days turned into weeks, turned into months, and before long it was just a distant memory, and I never really thought about it, and at some point did forget about it, until just now when I saw Harrison peeling the bark off of the tree, and it it brought it back, and that's why you heard me say, so weird. That was my reaction to it, because I'm wondering, who was that guy, and, and what happened to him? Like, that's so creepy. After Jen told her mother this story, she was expecting her mom to be a little bit horrified by it because it is a pretty startling story about her own child. But Jen's thinking it's been so long since this happened and nothing came of it that her mom would probably quickly move on from it. 
but Jen noticed her mom looked very concerned. And she turned to her and she goes, mom, this happened like two decades ago. Like, this is not a big deal. And her mom looks down for a second and then looks up and she has this look of, of guilt on her face. And she says to her daughter, Jen, I should have told you this when, when it happened, but it's just, you were so young and, and I, I felt like I was gonna ruin your childhood. And so I just didn't tell you. And it seemed like you forgot about it, but obviously you didn't. And so I, I guess, I guess you got to hear the full story now. Jen's confused at this point and she says, what are you talking about? And her mother, who now looks really uncomfortable, you know, she's touching her face and she looks very anxious. She says to Jen, it's time you learned who that man really was. Before Jen could ask any more questions, her mom just says, honey, just sit down and, and I will explain everything to you. So they sit down and Jen's mom is still acting pretty uncomfortable. This is obviously a difficult subject for her. And she starts by saying, okay, so do you remember how in our neighborhood where you grew up, everybody seemed to know each other? You know, it was a, a really tight community of people. And Jen's like, yeah, I remember that. And her mom was like, well, because of that, it made it really easy to spot people that were, you know, outsiders that didn't live in the neighborhood. And so if a car came down the street and I didn't recognize it, I would find myself looking out the window and, and watching the car to see where it was going because there's no reason to be in this neighborhood unless you're a visitor or you live here. And so I was in the habit of people watching anybody that showed up that I didn't recognize. And I know a bunch of the other mothers in the neighborhood did the same thing, one of them being Frankie's mom. Anyways, on the same day that that creep came up to you and pinched your arm when you were eight years old in 1995, well, that morning, Frankie's mom, Sonia, she happened to look out her front window and she saw a vehicle she didn't recognize. And it was a work van, a white work van. It didn't have windows in the back and it was parked across the street near the Pinecone Forest. And so she assumed it must be a work truck and whoever had brought it here was, you know, working on one of the houses in the neighborhood. But where it was parked, it was not close to any one particular house. And there was lots of places you could have parked on the street. So it seemed odd if you're gonna be doing work on a house that you wouldn't just park in front of the house. Like why would you park, you know, inconveniently farther away in front of this random forest. And so that got her thinking that something's up with this fan, but she didn't, she didn't think it was bad. She just was trying to make sense of it. And so all morning she found herself going to the window and looking out to see if someone was gonna claim this van, but she never saw anybody go near it. She didn't see workers going in and out of it. She didn't see any activity that was related to the van. It was just this empty van parked randomly across the street. And by the afternoon, when still no one had claimed this vehicle, she was getting ready to call the police. So that same day, you and Frankie had spoken on the phone and planned to meet up at the Pinecone Forest after he was done with his homework. And he didn't tell his mom about these plans. And so she didn't know that you would be very close to this van. Had she have known that, she would have told you to not wait out there, but instead to come right inside and don't go near this van. So at some point in the afternoon, when Sonia's getting ready to call the police and you were actually already over at the Pinecone Forest waiting for Frankie, Sonia's looking out the window and she sees the back two doors fly open and that guy who pinched you jumps out of the back and starts running into the Pinecone Forest. And from where Sonia's looking, she can only see part of the forest. The other portion of it is to the right. That's out of her view through this window. And so she turns and runs in her house to the side window of her house. And she looks out at that section of the Pinecone Forest where this guy has run to and she sees you standing in front of the tree and she sees this guy sprint right up to you and sees him pinch you in the arm and he's talking to you and that's when she ran out onto the porch and yelled for you to come inside and she would tell me later that when she did that she tried to sound very natural she was worried if she sounded like this was an emergency not only would it frighten you but it might trigger this stranger to grab you or take you because now he's been made you know someone realizes he's a bad guy and he might take you and so the whole time she's watching you, she was watching him to see if he was gonna chase you. And so when you came inside, she did her best to be totally calm and told you to go play with Frankie. And as soon as you were out of the room, she ran around the house and locked all the doors, all the windows, and then called me. And we decided it made sense to call the police. Even though you were safely in the house, we didn't know who this guy was. And it seemed like he was intentionally targeting you, like he was waiting for you the whole time. And so Sonia calls the police and a police cruiser was sent over to our neighborhood. And they quickly found the white van that matched the description. They pull up next to it and they walk to the drive driver's side and sitting inside the car is a man that matches the description of what Sonia gave and he's acting really weird you know he looked like he was on drugs or maybe he was he was drunk or something was wrong with him something was off about him and so the officers had him step out of the car 
and they search his car. And in the front two seats, there was nothing but you know, cigarette butts and trash. And there was a partition wall between the front two seats and the, the back workspace of the van. They went around to the back of the van and they see this guy has screwed a latch onto the back of the two doors right across the middle and there's a padlock through it. So there's an additional lock on this back door. Clearly, he doesn't want anybody getting in the back of this thing. And so the police turn to this guy and they're like, we need to get in the back of your truck. Can you please open this? And at first he was, you know, making excuses why he couldn't open it. But finally he relented and pulled out a special keychain he was carrying that had two distinct keys on it. And he used one of them to undo the padlock. He opened that up and then he swung open the doors and he backed up. And the police look inside and they can't believe what they're looking at. Inside of this van, all over every surface in the back were pictures of you taped to the walls, to the ground, to the back. I mean, everywhere you looked, there was a picture of you. And they weren't just recent pictures of you. There was at least a couple pictures of you when you were six years old and you were eight when he approached you. So we know he was following you for at least two years. Also in the back of the van were binoculars as well as a camera that presumably he was using to take these pictures of you. But that's not even the worst part. After this guy got arrested, one of the officers pulled out that keychain that had the key to the padlock on the back of his van, and he noticed the other key on the keychain was not just a duplicate key to the same padlock. It was a different, unique key. And so the police go over to this guy and they show him the key and they say, what is this to? And he says, it's to my storage locker. And so the police track down a storage locker and they go over there and they unlock the lock with the key and they open the door and what's inside is straight out of a nightmare. The entire storage locker, the ceiling, the floor, the walls, all of it was covered in clear plastic wrap. And behind the plastic wrap, you could see on the walls were hundreds more pictures of you. And in the middle of the storage locker was a dentist chair that had been anchored to the ground. Next to the dentist chair was this silver tray like you would see in a dentist's office, except on it were all these knives. And they were not surgical or medical knives. They were like meat cleavers and hunting knives, crude instruments. And then next to that on a table was an anatomy book where he had used printouts of you to bookmark different parts of the book that he was taking notes on and highlighting, all of which had to do with the female anatomy. In the back of the locker was a rotted mattress that was just sitting on the ground and anchored in the back on the wall were chains with handcuffs extending off of them. And then next to the bed were dozens of empty five gallon drums. When the police showed us pictures of the inside of his van, we were very shaken up. It was just so awful to imagine someone taking advantage of you in that way, you know, watching you. But when they showed us pictures of the chamber that he had created inside of his storage locker, that's just something I'll never get over. He clearly had plans for you. After hearing this story from her mother, Jen is a mixture of angry with her mom for not telling her sooner, but also sad, you know, that her mom had to go through that with her child because now Jen is a mother and she can only imagine how horrible that must have been for her then and even still now. And so all Jen could think to do was give her mom a hug. After they embraced, Jen asked her mom, you know, what happened to this guy? You know, where is he? Did he go to jail? And her mom told her that he had confessed to stalking Jen, and he confessed that everything they found in the storage locker in his van was his, and that he understood the implications, but he never gave his real motives for it or really what his intentions were. He was ultimately put into a high security mental institution for the criminally insane, and her mom said she has no idea if he's still alive or if he's been transferred, but that was the last she knew about him. And so Jen wound up doing some homework and figured out where he was being held. And she asked to have a meeting with him because she wanted to ask him to his face, what were you planning to do to me? I, I want to know why you did this. And he agreed to take this meeting. But the day before they were supposed to have it, he took his own life. And so Jen doesn't know if that was brought on by their impending meeting. It certainly seems likely. But unfortunately, that's it. She doesn't get any more answers. And it will end with a big question mark of what was he going to do to me and why?
you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please sneak under the Amazon Music Follow Buttons chair and tie their shoelaces together. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories we have posted on our main YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. Consider donating to our charity. It's called the Mr. Ballin Foundation, and it provides support to victims of violent crime as well as their families. Monthly donors to the Mr. Ballin Foundation Honor Them Society will receive free gifts and exclusive invites to special live events. Go to mrballin.foundation and click Get Involved to join the Honor Them Society today. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. Lastly, we have some really cool merchandise, so head on over to shopmrballin.com to have a look. So that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, see ya.